It begins here in a mountain meadow. It might be any of a million streams enlacing the earth. But in speed and force, it builds with a suddenness imaginable only in mountainous terrain. It thunders through a canyon deeper and narrower than the famous Grand Canyon of the Colorado. It is turbulent, cold, violent. It is known as the Salmon River, the river of no return. Its watershed in Idaho is one of the largest and least accessible wilderness areas in America. This man is Glenn Lau, a filmmaker. With a camera crew, he will travel many days and miles on the river in rubber rafts. The object of the trip is to meet a man remarkable in our time. A man who has lived in the canyon 40 years alone. He is a master of the art of survival, of peaceful coexistence with nature. He is a living, authentic mountain man, perhaps the last of a legendary kind. Billy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just not very much. I'd like to get down there and see him myself, though. He's supposed to be quite a man. Done a lot of a lot of things you you wish you could do yourself, you know. And he sat out there and he's done them. What kind of stories do you hear about him? Well, I've heard some awful stories. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. Like what? Well, he just got discussed country and left. No, he wouldn't be a mountain man, you know, if he was a socialite. You from Salmon? Yes, sir. Let me ask you something. Uh, have you lived here all your life? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard of a man who lives up the Salmon River? He's known as a mountain man. Uh-uh. See, he's Buckskin Bill. I've heard him talk about him, but I don't know him or anything like that. I, I could say nothing like that because uh -huh. I really don't know. I don't know what the man is like or anything. I've heard quite a bit. I've what, what heard you, it and I've, and I've forgot it. Yeah, so what, really what do you hear about it? Well, I haven't heard anything bad or I don't know. Really, I, what I've heard, I don't remember. Uh -huh. It's been so long ago. You ever hear of him? What's his name? Buckskin Bill. Buckskin Bill. Yes, I've heard of him. I couldn't tell you whether he's still living or not. <laughs> he lived down down the river, there for years, quite a character. The weather forecast for the Salmon River Country, Traveler's Advisory has been issued. I'm really worried today, about the weather, Terry. Rain, I think that uh, we're confronted with a bad situation here in the fall. You know, it could turn cold. And I don't want to leave on the trip until it looks like we're going to have some fairly good weather. Right now it looks pretty good, Glenn, but uh, like I said, it could change any day, and if it does change, we're just going to have to live with it. I've seen plenty of snow this time of year, so hopefully it'll be cold like it is right now. I got my box full. I don't even know where to start with the rest of this stuff, though. 65 miles from Salmon, at Road's End, the raft trip begins. The group sorts and loads a cargo of incredible size. Canned goods, sleeping bags, tents, cameras, recorders, bailing buckets, air pumps, and patch kits. All of it, and the four guides and the eight-person film crew, will float safely on four rafts. Lau makes a last-minute check with Terry Andreessen, who's in charge of the guide service. Andreessen is 31, with several years' experience on the river. He has a master's degree in forest hydrology and first came here while working for the U.S. Forest Service, making water quality samples. He left that job for the adventure of guiding. Need a bucket, Ed? The time is mid-October. Any day, snow could fall. The crew will travel through a vast and primitive tract of national forest, through a canyon more than a mile deep. Quite a wall, huh, Skip? 
Two members of the film crew are Skip Comstock and Charlotte Bauer. In the days ahead, they and the rest of the crew will negotiate rapids with names like Gun Barrel, Split Rock, Devil's Teeth, and Growler. To arrive at Buckskin Bills, they will travel 50 miles and drop a thousand feet. Three of the rafts are 18-footers, steered with oars. The fourth is this 22-footer, steered with aluminum sweeps. Called a J-rig, it is made of military bridge pontoons. It carries most of the filming lead. Within the National Forest are scattered private properties. This one belongs to a remarkable woman. Since her husband died in 1974, Frances Wisner has lived here alone. Her property is a small but picturesque ranch on a sloping bench above the river. Her contact with the outside world is an airplane which lands every week in summer, every two weeks in winter. The pilot has a government contract to deliver mail and supplies to the isolated residents of the Salmon Canyon. If grounded by storms, he may arrive many days late. But Frances Wisner is used to delay. Before the air service began, she once got Christmas gifts in August. Um, my grandpa told me about mountains, trees, and uh, when I figured I was reach maturity, I started looking for a mountain. I come out to Idaho and came horseback, first day of September, 1940. And up here above the barn, the way that timber is, you don't see the ranch coming from Chamberlain until you're just above the barn, and then it's all opened out in Jim's place, too. And I stopped my horse and I looked. To me, it's the most beautiful place in the world. I said, well, I don't know how you're going to do it, Francis. But you are going to drive a nail in the wall of that house and hang your toothbrush yeah. on it. And you're through traveling. Well, I didn't drive the nail. I put a toothbrush and toothpaste in a water glass in the dish cupboard. And it took me two years before all at once the guy that owned the place decided he'd better marry her if he's ever going to have anything to say about running the ranch again. <laughs> and I'm still here. Frances Wisner is twice widowed. She has lived on the Salmon River since 1940 and plans to stay here the rest of her life. She has a garden, an orchard, and a raspberry patch. She carries drinking water from an irrigation channel and cooks on a wood-burning stove. For a weekly newspaper, she writes articles on the canyon and its history. She is busy here, and she is happy. I'm one of the lucky creatures that the chores that I have to do are things I like to do. And I live where a lot of people would gladly pay anything you ask for the privilege of coming on a vacation. And that I don't sweep my floors for four or five days, okay, I'm on vacation, I'm not working now. But I'm right here. Does that tell you why I'm here? Today? You can have anything you want here. All it costs you is labor. And if you'll bother to learn how, you can even have it with your own labor. 
In the meadows and orchards around her house, Frances Wisner has a panorama of an earlier America. For her, deer and eagles and bears are commonplace sights. To city people, Frances Wisner's life may seem lonely. I think the thing that I think about more often is, thank God it happened. It was the day I stopped that horse up there above the barn and just looked at it. And I'm through traveling. I don't give a damn if I never go nowhere again. This is it. There's nothing you can possess that you could hold in your hand that compares with just, I'm home. Buckskin Bill today. How about you, Glenn? Today's the day. Oh, is it? Yeah. Good. How's our supplies doing? Oh, we're in pretty good shape yet. We could survive another week if we had to, but if you want to eat good, we got about another day's worth. <laughs> we run across the gear. You could talk to Mike about this afterwards and get his yeah. side of the story. I like to get in the upper part of the eddy and just kind of stay there and then let this out about 40 yards. It's got to be about 40 yards. And then I got a little piece of nail polish. And then you just play it back and forth across the eddy. And you feel it kind of wiggle a little bit. And the end of your pole wiggles a little bit. Well, what happens if you don't get it out far enough to where the nail polish is at? Then you don't have enough line out. <laughs> just reel it in real fast. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a good technique. Have you ever caught any fish uh, with it? No. No fish? <laughs> Hell of a technique. <laughs> it's pretty rasty. Is it? Yeah. It's Have you good. been doing it long? It's good when the water's snarly like this. No, well, yeah, about ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just started. <laughs> The crew has been on the river for five days now, and within a few hours, we'll arrive at Buckskin Bills. Sylvan Hart was born in 1906, in the Indian Territory later to become Oklahoma. He grew up hunting, fishing, exploring Indian camps. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma. At 28, he came to the Salmon River, built a cabin, and prospected for gold. He has lived here ever since, a life of independence and resourcefulness, which has earned him the nickname Buckskin Bill. Well, they asked me a question one time, what was your problem when you, when you first came here? No problems at all. I, when I came here, I got away from all the problems I had. Oh, and then of course hunting, fishing, cooking, gardening, and all that sort of thing. Is, you know, isn't, isn't even work, it's just fun. <clears throat> work or fun, 
Buckskin Bill is busy in his garden every day in summer. He fertilizes his soil with birch leaves, fish heads, animal droppings, and kitchen waste. In the sponge-like humus which results, he grows some 20 kinds of vegetables, most of them root vegetables which keep well for use all winter. Over here you've got purple potatoes. And uh, do you want to see them now? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Well, here I'll show you what they what you like. See, they're I purple. I've ever seen a purple. Mm -hmm. See, they're purple on the outside. Dude. Now, if this isn't purple on the inside, why, my face will be red. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Mm -hmm. the, when, you, when it's cooked, it turns blue. But you see, when you make potato salad, there with your egg, your olive, however you make it, See, it's a nice look, makes a nice looking salad. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And strong. there's more taste to these than there is to the others. Smell that, Bobby. Make a nice order of hash browns. <laughs> hmm? And then they're a good, they're a good solid potato. They keep until let the me, next. Let me take a look at that knife there. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll give you this. this. There's. Mm -hmm. yeah. You made this, is mm -hmm. that right? Right from scratch? Pocket knife, yeah, made all parts. Buckskin Bill is one of the last blacksmiths, and one of the best. The metal he uses is scrap, bandsaw blades discarded by sawmills, nickel steel magnets from Model T autos. Cranking a blower, he softens the metal on a fire of mountain mahogany, then shapes it on the anvil. From it, he has made literally hundreds of pots, knives, and tools. But the real work begins after the tool is made, when it is finally put to use. With a fro and a wooden mallet, he splits shingles to make a new roof. With other tools, he has shaped and joined every board in his buildings. Has the way of life on the Salmon River been changing? Yes, yes, it's, been, it's changed somewhat. We had packers, miners, and old timers, and uh, there attitude towards life was in uh, adjusting towards their surroundings. Where uh, if a person comes here now, uh, the trouble with these people have had guest ranches and the like of that. When the person comes there, he, he brings Los Angeles with him. He brings New York with him, which is one of the saddest things that you could, you, you could think of and one of the poorest things to do. And uh, this, this country doesn't need... Uh, doesn't need all the refinements they, they, they'd have at Los Angeles. It doesn't need or couldn't use super highways and, in, in things of the like, things like that. And uh, when, uh, when in Rome, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That's pretty good advice anyway. <clears throat> uh, people uh, finally, finally see that they're being cheated in those places where they're nothing. If you can look out of your house, and see another house, you're a poor man. And uh, look at the guy, and he's living up on the 57th story of a skyscraper. He's got no place to fish. He's got no place to hunt. He's got no place to to, to do anything. And he has to buy every, buy everything. And uh, and when um, when you have to buy everything, there's a good chance that people can cheat you. Yeah, or they'll tell you they've got advertising to tell you it's good when it isn't. Where your cat? Look, he's doing his job. Yeah, well, now that's an honest cat. It's got a mouse. <clears throat> Wampus. Say those cats catch some birds? What? Those cats catch mm -hmm. some birds? I'm going to be an ornithologist and identify every bird my cat brings in. Won't that look good <laughs> with the Audubon Society? <laughs> an uh, arrow. Arrow ornithologist, a cat ornithologist. <laughs> Buckskin Bill made this bridge many years ago, driving spikes into the granite cliff, connecting them to logs and cables. In spring, when the sandbar below is flooded, the bridge is his only route downriver. Now, when the water is low, he tests the web like rigging and pinning and makes any needed repairs. He crosses always with caution. If you are a man that are always having close calls, that shows you're no good. And when you do, when you go anywhere and do anything, you 
figure out everything to the last minute. And, uh, when, and you must uh, remember what is the best time of the day to try something that is dangerous. Which was better, the old days or the new days? Well, the, we, I, don't, I don't complain about anything. But uh, if you had your choice between a flintlock rifle and lots of game and, um, and a lot of modern technology, why, well, I'd take the, the older type, you see, and, and my chances there. What's it like being behind that gun when you squeeze the trigger off? Oh, oh this, is just, this is just a little old gun. <laughs> All it needs is a man behind it. <laughs> Does it kick a lot? Well, there's, there's considerable recoil. You realize you've got a real gun. There's no doubt about that. Buckskin Bill made this huge musket himself. With a heavy load of black powder, it fires a six-ounce lead ball. It is accurate enough to hit a deer at 100 yards. He has made many rifles, even a pistol. He has bored the barrels, carved the stocks, forged the hammers and triggers. Under primitive conditions, he has done precise, artistic work no modern factory could equal. With these guns, Buckskin Bill hunts for food. When you kill a deer, the first meal should be a great fried meal of brains, one kidney, liver, heart, um, sweet bread, and uh, any other odds and ends that you might want to eat there. And then if, you've, uh, if you're lacking, in, if, you, if you need a little vitamin or a little medicine of some kind, it's in there. And you'll, uh, you always feel better after a meal or two like that. The film crew has encountered a way of life, a degree of independence almost gone from America. Here on the Salmon River, Buckskin Bill has made and done everything for himself. Hunting, carving, hoeing, building. He has formed a philosophy as simple and durable as a world of wood and stone and water. You can ask me anything about anything, he says, and I can answer because I've had time to think about it. With his work, with his way of looking at things, Buckskin Bill has done more than merely survive. His life in this uncrowded country has been an art, a continuous creative act. It's a place where everything's in, in your favor. If you really know or know anything, you know, why, it's the best place of all to live. If you can understand all the animals, plants, minerals, things in your, that are around you and can adapt yourself to, to the MOI, your troubles will be mighty small. This program is dedicated to Francis Wisner and Buckskin Bill and to all the people who live in the remaining backcountry regions of America.